Welcome back, everyone, to another reaction video. Well, I just got back from France a couple of days ago, and one of the last stops that I made with my friend Rob from History in Your Hand uh, was in Compiègne, which is the site of the armistice. Not only the armistice that uh, put an end to the fighting in World War I, but also the armistice that put an end to the fighting between Germany and France, at least for a while, in 1940 during World War II. Uh, so going to be bringing you some content from that visit to the site, but I thought with tomorrow being the anniversary of Armistice Day, November 11th, it would be a good time to take a look at one of my absolute favorite channels. This is Battle Guide, and if you have not seen their channel, definitely check it out. I'll put the link in the description to the original of this video, but I would encourage you to use that link as an opportunity to check out all of their fantastic content. I've had a number of opportunities to talk to the guys from Battle Guide, uh, kind of behind the scenes, and I love what they do. Uh, even before they had uh, all this content on YouTube, they had it as a subscription service, and it's really, really good stuff. I love the way they present everything. So this is the brutal final minutes of World War I, uh, and uh, we're just going to kind of watch and see what they talk about. I'm assuming this is going to be not only about the armistice, but about what happened in the final hours of combat on November 11th, because there were something like nearly 3,000 men who died uh, on that last day between when the armistice was signed and when it took effect, uh, which is one of the sad tragedies in an otherwise already sad and tragic conflict. Uh, give a shout out to a couple of my friends who I have had the opportunity now to tour uh, Germany and Austria with, Michael in Edgewood, Maryland, and Joe in Halifax. Uh, he's from Halifax, lives in London. Thank you guys so much, not only for your friendship, but also for your support on Patreon. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. It was just a few strokes of a pen in an old rail carriage near Compiègne in the early hours of the 11th of November 1918, which signaled an end to years of destruction that's Ypres on the right Western there. Front. That, that's definitely the town of Ypres in Belgium, which was just brutalized during the war. Uh, you can see right in there, that's the center of town, and uh, going to be going back there in May. I'm excited about that. During that time, close to 9 million men had lost their lives. But who was and, the... And that's just the military casualties, right? There was probably an equal number of civilian casualties. It's 15 to 20 million total. Last to fall. In this video, we'll count down the hours, minutes, and seconds and follow the fate of those men who were destined never to see the end of the First There's World Henry Gunther War. Right there. By November 1918, the outcome of the war on the Western Front had long been clear. The German army's last major defensive positions had been shattered as far back as August, and since then, in an offensive known as the Hundred Days, the Allies had relentlessly pursued the Germans at every opportunity. This return to open warfare had been extremely costly for all involved, and losses so close to the end were all the more painful. That's true, and what he mentions there about return to open warfare is absolutely true. Remember, the first months of the war, and really the last months of the war on the Western Front, is where it's a war of movement. Everything in between, from like the fall of 1914 to the spring of 1918 is trench warfare. It's measured in yards and in a few cases, a few miles here and there. Uh, and so it's especially tragic when you think about, so for example, the Somme uh, and the, the hundreds of thousands uh, of casualties there uh, for the British to move the line a couple of miles or Ypres where they at Passchendaele moved the line a couple miles. And then in the spring of 1918, they'd lose all of it. Um, 1918, the Americans have entered the war. They declared war in April 1917, but it's really early 1918 when large numbers of Americans are going to start arriving on the Western Front. It also coincides with uh, the Russians had signed their uh, armistice in December 1917, so they're out of the war. So there's that window of time where the Germans can rush a bunch of units from the Eastern Front, something like 50 divisions to the Western Front, and they're going to try to break the Allies before the, the Americans can arrive and turn the tide. Uh, but what ends up happening is they kind of exhaust their last real strength in that. And now those Americans arriving are going to give the Allies a decisive advantage and they're just going to start pushing back big time. And so, when on the early morning of the 11th of November, news finally arrived that fighting would come to an end, millions of men drew a collective breath of relief. 
just a few hours to go. First, let's explore the relative positions of various Allied nations as they approached 11am. In the north, the Belgian army, after years of holding positions around the deadly Issa sector, was on the advance. I, like I said, I love how they present stuff on this channel, the maps and everything. They do such a great job of making it accessible, making it understandable by using maps and drones and images and quotes. And it's just it, like if I was making my perfect YouTube channel and I had the, the resources and the talent to be able to put something together, this is how I would do it. Um, yeah, so the Isa River. Uh, if you're familiar with Sabaton, uh, the song where they talk about flooding, uh, you know, they're going to flood the river. This was a choice by the king of the Belgians uh, to deny uh, Germany that last little sliver of Belgium. There's this place called the Trench of Death that you can visit that is in that place where they held on to that little sliver. With leading units pursuing the Germans across this ground around the city of Ghent. To their south, the war-weary British were advancing across terrain they had last seen in those early days of the war and were, by now, advancing on the town of Mons, the scene of their very first engagement in the summer of 1914. Yeah, and so Mons, yeah, like he said, is where it started, and you're going to have this great irony of the last British casualty of the war being killed very close to where the first British casualty was killed, and they're actually buried almost right next to each other, like within a few feet of each other. The first and last death of the British Army are buried in the same cemetery. Uh, so you see right here kind of the border between the French and the British, that's where the, the Germans had focused their spring offensive, sometimes called the Ludendorff Offensive or the Kaiserschlacht. It was actually a series of offensives, um, but uh, th they were hoping to drive a wedge between the British and the French, drive the British out of the war, and force the French to the negotiating table on favorable terms. In the lead were cavalry and the infantry of the highly regarded Canadian Expeditionary Force. Further to their south, the major player of the Great War, yep. the French army, were now pushing forwards towards the German border, crossing their... I'm so glad he said that, because, listen, we give the French so much grief for World War II, but in World War I, they were the workhorses of the Western Front. They were the heavy lifters as far as casualties, as far as numbers. And even the Americans, who have their own sector at Meuse-Argonne at this point in the war, uh, they're... Tanks are French, their artillery is French, their planes are French, because uh, they just didn't have that stuff of their own. They wanted to get men over there, but that meant using a lot of French equipment. Their devastated homelands and liberating thousands of their own compatriots each day. And between those French armies, having fought through the Meuse Argonne, were the doughboys of the American Expeditionary Force. Despite the relatively short time they'd spent in large numbers on the Western Front, their contribution had been significant. Across the ever-changing front lines were some 185 German divisions. Starving, bloody and bone-tired, in most cases they were desperate to see the end of a war which had claimed millions of their countrymen's yeah. lives. And so, as the sun rose shortly after 7am on the 11th of November, the Allies, mostly unaware of the armistice signed a few hours earlier, planned to continue their advance. But this begs the question, with the war so nearly over, why attack at all on that day? So before he gets into that, let's talk back up a little bit and just briefly kind of recap what leads to the armistice. By, by September, it's clear to the Germans they cannot continue, that they're on their last legs. Uh, contrary to popular belief later on where guys like Ludendorff will claim that they were stabbed in the back by the civilian authorities, it was men like Ludendorff and Hindenburg who were leading the charge and telling the German uh, command, we can't win this war, we need to negotiate now before things get worse for us. This is as good as it's going to get. Let's negotiate now. And they grabbed on to Woodrow Wilson's 14 point as the most favorable terms they were likely to get, which was true. And it probably would. Listen, y'all know my hate for Woodrow Wilson, but had they gone with his points, maybe the outcome's not so bad in the next 20 years. I don't know. Just a thought. But it, it's in October when they really start talking about bringing something together. Uh, and so then uh, it's in the first week of November, uh, like, like the 7th or the 8th, that uh, the German delegation is going to arrive at Campania. And um, 
It's led by a guy named Matthias Erzberger, who will be assassinated a few years later because of his role in that as part of the whole stab in the back myth. Uh, he was a Catholic, he was a civilian, and it was thought that he would be able to better negotiate favorable terms. But basically, they show up and uh, they've got these two rail cars, right? Ferdinand Foch, who's the uh, Allied Commander in Chief, is in one. The German delegation's got one of their own. And um, basically, they meet with Foch, and Foch is like, all right, here's our list of demands, take it or leave it. Until then, the fighting continues. It was basically a demand for a surrender. And he knew he was negotiating from a position of strength at that point. Uh, and so they're kind of debating what to do, the Germans are. And uh, all the negotiations negotiations that take place take place with other people, not with Foch directly. He's going to be there for the first meeting and then for the signing, and that's it. Um, and basically, the only things they're really able to negotiate are just factual errors, things like when they say, this is how many subs you need to surrender, and the Germans are like, well, we don't even have that many subs, those kinds of things. Um, but finally, uh, they find out the Kaiser has abdicated, I think, on like the 10th, um, and they're, they're told, uh, Erzberger and the others are told, just listen, if you can't get any other concessions, it doesn't matter, just sign. Just sign no matter what. End this war. Day. Well, the answer, simply and tragically, is why not? The need yeah, um, and I forgot to mention, too, it's signed at 5 a.m. The Germans wanted to take effect right away. And if they had wanted it to, to stop, wanted the fighting to stop while they were negotiating, Allies wouldn't do it. But then, even then, they wanted it to take effect right away. The Allies said no. And then a bunch of commanders actually issue orders to attack. They want to push and take more ground before it takes effect to continue to drive the enemy back, seize advantageous ground and deplete their opponent's resources was the same as it had been for years before. Even after news of an armistice began to trickle out to the front line shortly after dawn, plans to advance were still made. We should remember an armistice is not an end to fighting, but rather a pause. Although we know it today, in November 1918, nobody knew that the fighting on the Western Front would never restart. And so, cold-blooded as it might sound. The orders for units to capture this ridge or deploy on that hill in the final moments before the armistice did make some sense. He makes a great point there. The armistice was not a peace treaty. It was a pause, and it actually had to be renewed several times before uh, the Treaty of Versailles was actually agreed to uh, in 1919, and then I think actually doesn't actually take effect till like January of 1920. Um, so, we can look back at hindsight and say, well, this is crazy, but he's right. There, there was no guarantee the fighting didn't pick back up again. If the fighting did restart, holding a tactically superior position would be a real advantage. Sadly, though, as with everything in the Great War, these moves came with a cost. There's Essex oh. Farm Cemetery. That's where um, uh, Peter, or John McRae wrote uh, in Flanders Fields told some 2,000 men lost their lives on that very last day of the Great War on the Western Front, some tragically close to 11 a.m. Yeah. So with a few hours to go, let's move north to the British sector around Mons to follow the advance. It was in this very area at approximately 9.30 a.m. that men of the 5th Irish Lancers found themselves, their job being to probe eastwards to ascertain the location of the German rearguard and to maintain pressure on the withdrawing enemy. Amongst their number was this man, Private George Edwin Ellison. So what do we know about George? Let's turn to the available military records at Find My Past to find out more. Hey, great website, by the way, especially if you're researching uh, UK records. Fantastic. Must be the sponsor. Hey, Find My Past. Hook me up, man. By inputting George's full name and known details, we find a huge array of records. First off is the census of 1881, which shows a two-year-old boy a confectioner's son, living with his family in Union wow. Court in the ancient city of York. His date of birth of 1878 tells us that George was, rather surprisingly, 40 years old in 1918. Further searches also show us that George had joined the British Army as a regular soldier around 1902, oh, wow. but by 1911 had returned to civilian life before rejoining the army as a private with the Fifth Lancers. With See, this is why I love genealogy. This stuff is so cool to me, just seeing all these records and, and learning so much of this guy's story other than the, the last moment of his life. He'd seen action at Mons, Ypres, Loss, and Cambrai. 
until mm. eventually returning to Mons wow. in 1918. Survived all those places. Records tell us that having ridden through the town square of Mons to much adulation from the local population, Ellison and his comrades advanced northeast, passing through the leading infantry of the Canadian Saskatchewan Regiment to continue their pursuit of the enemy. An official report of C Squadron 5th Lancers records the following moments. Two platoons under the orders of Lieutenant Biggs headed for the Har Forest, where they met with machine gun fire. Another patrol was sent to the north end of the wood in order to try and reach the canal beyond. This patrol spotted German cyclists and, after venturing into the woods, was greeted with more machine gun fire. Lieutenant Biggs then tried to capture the machine gun, but failed. It was 9.30am and the patrol left the wood to give way to infantry. Hmm. Hour and a half before the end. It was in the act of this final movement, one which would have seen Ellison and his men move towards safety, that a single shot rang out, striking Ellison in the chest and tumbling him from his horse. 40-year-old Private George Ellison died on this spot just outside Mons an hour and a half before the armistice took effect becoming the last of almost one million British servicemen to fall to enemy fire in the First World War. That's a gut punch. About the same time that George Ellison fell, news of the armistice had reached Paris and swept like wildfire through the city. Those who had spent years wondering if their loved ones would return could now, finally, see a glimmer of hope. By 10am, the British population were also aware, with a formal announcement. The armistice was signed at 5 o'clock this morning, and hostilities are to cease on all fronts at 11 a.m. today. There was, I was standing there with Rob at the exact spot where the armistice was signed. There's a marker there that has Ferdinand Foch's name on it, uh, right in the middle of the train tracks. And we were just kind of taking in the fact that here was a war that cost upwards of 20 million lives, and we were standing in the spot where the act took place that put a stop to it. But then think about if you are one of those 2,700 or so families whose son, brother, husband, father was killed after it was signed. Ugh. Less than an hour to go. Time between 10 and 11 that morning for millions of men must have felt like days, particularly yeah. for those in the vanguard of the Allied advance. To the north, the Belgian army, like the French, were advancing through their own country, liberating a population who had lived under occupation for more than four years. By now, the leading forces had reached the ghent turnesen Canal, where German machine guns were still in action. At 10.42am, to the backdrop of Belgian cheers of men who were already celebrating the impending peace, three men crept forwards towards the canal bank to identify the location of the enemy fire. A single burst hit all three, including 24-year-old Liège native Corporal Marcel Liege. Terve, who was shot through the left lung. Despite desperate attempts to save him, Marcel died three minutes later at 10.45am, <sighs> the last Belgian soldier to fall. At almost exactly the same moment, 100 miles away, between the large towns of Sedan and Charleville-Mézières, Private First Class Augustin Trebuchon, another 40-year-old veteran who had survived the hellish fighting on the Marne, the Somme and at Verdun, was on the move. Trebuch you survived Verdun. I mean, the Battle of the Marne. These are some of the worst battles in human history. Ugh. And then you die in the last hours? as a runner with the 415th Infantry Regiment had been fortunate to make it this far as his role of carrying messages between headquarters and the front lines was a particularly deadly one. This day though, he was armed with good news. Word Food. had reached the men of the 415th that the fighting would stop and Trebuchon's message was a welcome muster at 11.30 for provisions. Think about the tragedy of that. He wasn't even carrying like an important military order, like cease fire at 11 or this or that. He's coming to tell them we're going to have hot soup at 11.30. Come and get some. Ugh. Moving forward towards the front lines in a light rain and in sub-zero temperatures, he no doubt still had a cheerful word for his comrades as he passed. Moments later, as he reached the front line, a burst of machine gun fire pierced the air in Trebuchon, message in hand, fell dead the last of more than one million Frenchmen to fall on the Western Front. Back in Paris, five minutes after Trebuchon fell, Maréchal Ferdinand Foch, Supreme Commander on the Western Front, issued the following order. 
Hostilities will cease on the whole front as from November 11 at 11 o'clock. The Allied troops will not, until further orders, go beyond the line reached on that date and at that hour. Perhaps a minute later, at 10.51am, back in the area of Mons, where George Ellison had been killed, the Allies cautiously continued their advance. By now, all were aware of the armistice, and for most, movement had stopped. Nobody wanted to take risks in the last few moments. No, who would? Well, almost nobody. Having been busy clearing houses that morning as they advanced through the villages beyond Mons, men of the 28th Canadian Infantry, including friends George Price and Art Goodworthy, were at the tip of the advance towards the Canal du Centre. But what do we know about George Price? Tracing his burial record, we learn that George and held... Listen, I will say, say it again and again and again. Pound for pound, no better soldiers on the Western Front than the Canadians. There's a reason they kind of got used as like the shock troops of the Allied advance. Uh, they were fantastic soldiers, and uh, it does not surprise me one bit that probably the last Commonwealth soldier to die is going to be a Canadian. From Port Williams, Nova Scotia, and according to the 1911 Canadian census, was at that time a farm laborer living hmm. with his parents and sister. His military service record tells us he was conscripted on the 15th of October 1917, arriving in France the following February. Hospitalised due to gas in September, he had only returned to the front lines in October. Ugh. Further official records tell us that with five minutes until 11am, George Price, Goodworthy and three other men decided on their own initiative to cross the enemy occupied canal and clear one last group of miners' cottages, from which a few minutes earlier German machine gun fire had been seen. Reaching the houses and checking them one by one, they discovered German soldiers setting up machine guns along a brick wall overlooking the canal. The Germans immediately opened fire, but shielded by the brick wall, all remained unharmed. Aware that they'd been discovered and outflanked, the Germans began to retreat. Price's patrol quickly entered the house that they thought the original fire was coming from, but found the Germans had exited through the back door as they had entered the front. They were about to move on when a Belgian family in one of the nearby houses called to the Canadians to take care. Against that advice, George stepped out of the house into the street and was immediately shot in the right breast by a German sniper. Pulled into one of the houses and treated by a young Belgian nurse who ran across the street to help, he died a minute later at 10.58 a.m. See, this is, like I said, why I love this channel so much. The, the maps, the, the images, the details, the quotes, it all just, the presentation style is just among my favorites becoming the last Commonwealth soldier killed in action. On Here comes the Henry Gunther. Front. A minute At later. At exactly the same moment, 104 miles away, north of the infamous battlefield of Verdun, the Americans too were on the move. Ten days earlier, they had finally broken through German lines in this sector and had been attacking ever since. By the morning of the 11th of November, advances were still being made in large numbers, including by the doughboys of the 313th Infantry Regiment, Baltimore's own. So, Meuse-Argonne Offensive, we're going to be talking a lot more about that in the coming months, and there's a few reasons why. But among those is I just went there and made some videos from that site. But uh, uh, Meuse River on the, on the right flank in the east, which is Verdun sits on the Meuse River. Uh, and then the Argonne Forest on the west, uh, the left side, bordered by the French Fourth Army. Argonne Forest is where you're going to have the Lost Battalion. You're going to have Alvin York, and those stories are happening in the Argonne. Um, but in the middle of this 20 mile or so wide advance uh, is this sector here. Amongst them was one private Henry Gunther. According to his draft enlistment card of June 1917, we learn that Henry was from Baltimore, Maryland, and a general bookkeeper before the war. Following his early years, we also learn from the US Census of 1900 that his parents' place of birth was in fact Germany, adding a powerful layer to his story. And it's an important part of this story. Available information also tells us that Henry had been promoted to supply sergeant after arriving in France, but a letter home in which he criticised the miserable conditions had seen him demoted and moved onto the front lines. So he had a, he had a friend back home uh, that he was kind of warning against coming to France in the army. 
Uh, and of course, these letters are, are being censored, they're being viewed, and it was seen that he was being critical of the war effort. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff you just can't do as a soldier on the front lines. He gets demoted to private, and that so upsets him that he's going to do everything he can to get back to sergeant again. It's quite possible that this demotion, which Henry took very badly, played a role in his tragic end. And I wouldn't even say it's just quite possible. There are actually quotes from men who served with him who said that's exactly why he did what he did. He was trying to uh, prove himself. He was trying to get uh, that promotion back, and, and he ended up getting it. They promote him to sergeant, and he gets the Distinguished Service Cross for really what was a, a very foolish act on his part. Further records tell us that Henry and the men of A Company 313th had marched, bayonets fixed, through thick fog across a marsh at 9.30 that morning towards the tiny village of ville de vent at which time German artillery had opened up, killing some of Henry's comrades. Nevertheless, they pushed on, reportedly taking their objective and finding cover in a shallow ditch facing the withdrawing Germans. Less than 20 minutes to go. It was at 10.44am that a breathless runner finally reached Gunther's small group, reporting that an armistice had been signed due to take effect in a few minutes' time. Opposite them, clearly visible guarding the road on the outskirts of the village were two German machine guns. We'll never know Henry's mindset in those final moments as the men around him looked on, but we do know what took place just seconds before 11am. Suddenly, Gunther jumped up and charged the machine guns. His fellow soldiers shouted for him to stop, as did the Germans. In fact, the machine gunners stood up and waved, urging him to turn around. Then, they had no choice. fired a shot. They had to shoot him. The Germans had no choice. They fired back in a five-round burst. One bullet struck Gunther in the left temple, and he fell to the ground. Those who were there swore that the rumbling of artillery stopped the very moment his body hit the earth. This spot's actually marked. There's a monument there, and it's up on a hill. It's, like, really hard to get to. <laughs> and the guys I was with uh, actually found some really incredible relics at that site in the field, uh, the farmer's field right next to it. Uh, Sander found a fork, I think it was, and Marcel actually found a big piece of an artillery shell, like literally a few feet away from the Gunther Memorial. Henry Gunther of Baltimore holds the tragic distinction of being remembered as the last Allied soldier to be killed in action on the Western Front, losing yep. his life literally seconds before the armistice came into effect. And... Unlike the other ones, this is very distinctly his choice, knowing that the armistice was about to take effect. Uh, just, it, it's so hard. It's so hard. And imagine how hard it was for his family back in Baltimore. And they didn't actually find out the details until, I think it was like March of 1919, when the chaplain from Gunther's unit went to visit them and told them exactly what the circumstances were of his death. Today there exists some controversy about the actual location in which Henry Gunther fell. Official records state that Gunther was killed and buried in an isolated grave at coordinates E332.6, N280.6, which when overlaid onto a wartime trench map is to be found right here. Though today a memorial stands reportedly on the spot where Henry fell some 1.5 miles away here. Hmm. Perhaps we'll never know the exact location. Oh, wow. But there is one more nation we need to consider when telling the story of the Western Front that day. Germany. Germany. Approximately 18 miles northwest of where Henry Gunther was killed, north of the town of Stunne, German troops were stationed opposite men of L Company, 356th US Infantry Regiment, who had been engaged in bitter fighting all morning during which time the regimental phone lines had been cut, leaving them unaware that an armistice was coming oh. into effect. Sadly, Lieutenant Thomas of the 19th Uhlans had been informed, and when shortly after 11am he emerged from his positions to approach the Americans to ask if all was over, rather than a welcome, he received a gunshot, which dropped him dead on the spot. I never knew officially this. Officially the last German to be killed in action oh. on the Western Front. But was he? In truth, probably not. Hmm. 
The popular picture of the armistice is one where at 11am all firing immediately stops and no further action takes place. The reality of course is far less clear cut. It's true that in most places a mix of relief and jubilation reigned, on both sides, as these remarkable scenes taken on the battlefield at that historic moment wow. show. And this is such a great reminder that the level of animosity between nations does not always translate into hatred among men. We see that with the 1914 Christmas truce. Now, a lot has transpired by 1918, especially if you're a French soldier who's, or Belgian whose land has been occupied by four, uh, these Germans for four years. Different level of friendliness with the Germans. But between Americans and Germans in particular, probably a lot of that went on uh, in, on the Armistice Day. Uh, so this this is relief, and this is, hey, I never wanted to kill you in the first place, and now I don't have to. But in a few areas, the fighting went on. Yeah. One British cavalry captain of the Oxfordshire Hussars to the southeast of Mons wrote the following in his diary. At 11.15, it was found necessary to end the days of a Hun machine gunner on our front who kept on shooting. The armistice was already in force. But there was no alternative. Perhaps his watch was wrong. But he was probably the last German killed in the war. A most unlucky individual. No. And we should reiterate here that just because the guns had stopped firing doesn't mean that the losses would stop. In yeah. other theatres around the world, fighting would go on for days, weeks, and even months. And, on the and not only that, but just like we see in Band of Brothers with World War II, just because the fighting stopped doesn't mean people don't keep dying. You've got millions of men with dangerous equipment and things like that. Heck, for that matter, people are still dying from World War I. There have been hundreds of people that have been killed by unexploded munitions. My friends and I were walking through a field outside of Verdun last week. And in the span of about 20 minutes, we found three unexploded French uh, P1 grenades. They're like this pear-shaped. Three of them in a field in probably about 100 feet of ground in 20 minutes. There are millions of unexploded grenades and artillery shells and other explosives that are out there. And even the people who are trained to dispose of this stuff have died in their hundreds from this stuff. Western Front, many men wounded in those final days would die in hospitals, their families receiving the dreaded news as their neighbours celebrated peace in the streets. The story of the last to fall has always been and will remain a powerful one. The idea of surviving the carnage of one of the most destructive wars in the history of mankind yeah. only to die in the last few moments is extremely powerful. There are many places where that story can be told, but perhaps the most poignant from a British perspective at least, can be found here. There it is. At San Symphorian Military Cemetery. In these peaceful surroundings outside Mons, by a strange quirk of fate lies Private John Parr, generally acknowledged to be the first British soldier killed in action on the Western Front. Directly opposite him is George Ellison, the last British soldier to fall. Two graves, separated by 10 steps and a million lives. That's powerful right there. That was a fantastic presentation. Thanks for taking the time to watch this. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. I, like I said, I just think they do such a great job with it. And I want to give a shout out to two people in Praha, in Prague, in Czechia, the Czech Republic, uh, Mikhail, and also my friend Vaslav. Uh, who was on the tour with us in Germany and Austria. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.